nach der Mittagspause. Wollen wir weitermachen? Jetzt mit einem Vortrag vom, vom Arne Wieberg vom CERN über OpenStack bei denen. Und äh, ja, viel Spaß. Thanks. So, hello everyone. Thanks for dropping by. My name is Arne Wieberg. I work at CERN and I'm responsible for the operation of our uh, private cloud in CERN IT, which is based on OpenStack. So, I will, in the next 45 minutes, um, I will give you an overview of our service, how we run it, some of the issues that we, that we encountered when building up this, this cloud. But before doing so, I'd like to introduce CERN a little bit, for those of you who haven't, are not that familiar with, with what CERN is. So CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research, and the acronym CERN actually comes from the French name, which is Centre Européen pour la Recherche Nucléaire. Um, it was founded in 1954, like uh, 10 years after the, after the World War, uh, has today 21 member states, which will become 22, with Romania joining in the next couple of months. But CERN is also very often used uh, as the name for the uh, largest particle physics laboratory, which is located at the border between France and Switzerland, close to, close to Geneva. Um, at CERN, we have about 2,300 staff members serving more than 12,500 users all over the world. And the yearly, yearly budget of CERN for this year is around um, 1 billion Swiss francs. So, so what's, the, what's the task of CERN? What's the mission? So CERN is searching answers to some of the fundamental questions uh, of the universe, or around the universe. So, Things like, uh, what is matter composed of? Where does mass come from? Why is there a discrepancy between matter and antimatter? Why does the universe look like the way it does? Um, and, and we're trying to explore and understand a little bit better uh, why things are as they are. Now, I'm very often faced <coughs> with a question, well, is, is it really worth the money that you're spending in order to answer these questions? Well, of course, it's, it's all very interesting, um, the, the fundamental research. But there are other things that come out of CERN. Um, so in order to answer some of these questions, we have to advance some of the technologies that exist today because the tools in order to answer these questions don't exist and we have to build them ourselves. And by doing that, we also push in certain areas the limits um, of what the technology can do. Also, there are some things that come out of CERN that are not or were not intended. Um, the World Wide Web, you may know. Um, There's, there are other things around um, medical imagery, for instance, where CERN has contributed large, uh, or a lot of stuff. So lots of kind of spin-offs and side effects um, by, by uh, doing fundamental research. Very important also is that <coughs> one of the tasks is to train the scientists and engineers of tomorrow. So young people come to CERN, they work there for two or three years, and then they go back Uh, into industry or into their home countries with the knowledge uh, of what they have seen and, and learned at CERN. And of course, all this was founded under the umbrella of, of science for peace. Um, so it brings nations together, so there are lots of nationalities at CERN and you work with people from all over the world, which is also very nice. So if you want to learn more about CERN, I invite you to go to home.cern, which is our, our website. We just acquired our own top-level domain, as you see. <coughs> I had to say this. Right, so, <coughs> I'm just kidding. So the, the tool, um, in order to um, understand what's going on in the universe, the main tool at the moment is the LHC. It's the Large Hadron Collider. It's a particle physics, or it's a particle collider. Um, what you see here is a map of the um, region of Geneva. So Geneva is, is around here. You see here the Geneva Airport. This is the Lake of Geneva. And this is the, um, the mountains, the Jura. And here, On the dotted red line, this is the, the border between Switzerland over here and France over here. What you also see is like these red areas here. So this is actually the CERN, the two CERN sites. So CERN has, in this area we have two sites, Merin, which is on the Swiss side, and Prefsin, which is on the, on the French side. And then you have, as the, as the yellow line, actually part of the accelerator complex. So it's a little bit hard to see, but you have a small ring here, which is the PS. Uh, which is very close to my office, which is around here. And then we have the SPS here. And then we have the Large Hadron Collider, uh, which is the, uh, the um, collider I just mentioned, with a circumference of 27 kilometers. And then 
here at these red dots, you have the so-called interaction points. So this is where the particles actually collide and where you have the four main LHC experiments which try to understand what's going to happen or what's happening when, these, when the protons collide. Now this is a look into the tunnel of the LHC. So the LHC was built into the tunnel of a former um, accelerator, which was LEP. Um, so why is it built underground? It's built underground for, for several reasons. So one is that it was way too expensive to buy all the land. I'm serious. Um, another thing is that because it's built underground, so it's 175 meters underground, um, it's drilled into the rock. So this gives you like very good stability because if I remember correctly, the, the, um, the accelerator on its circumference of 27 kilometers is aligned to one millimeter. Okay, so you can't have something that is moving up and down all the time that would disturb the experiments. The other thing is that <clears throat> because you have rock all around, it gives you a very nice natural shielding in both directions. So the population on top is not uh, is protected from the from the radiation that may be emitted by the accelerator, but also the accelerator itself and the experiments are protected from the from the cosmic rays. Okay. So the main thing, so you see here, so this is the tun tunnel, and you can see how it how it bends a little bit. Of course, this is an artistic view. You look inside the, inside the accelerator, you can see the two beam pipes. So this is where the protons actually circulate in this 27 kilometer um, accelerator in opposite directions. And they do so 11,000 times per second. Okay? So the protons circulate 27 kilometers 11,000 times per second. So this is very close to the speed of light. In order to actually force the particles on their on their tour there, the main thing here are the are the magnets. So they're like something like 9,600 magnets that control the beam, that force it onto the onto the ring, that make sure that the, the particles stay closely together. And for, for bending, for instance, there are like 1,200 dipole magnets, each of them 40 meters long, 14 meters long, 35 tons, which generate a magnetic field of 8.3 tesla, which is roughly 200,000 times stronger than the magnetic field of the Earth. And the electricity that's in the wires here is around 12,000 kiloamps. So that compares to your 10 to 20 amps that you have at home. So it's pretty, pretty high current. <clears throat> now, what we use in order to um, reduce the, the cost um, is running these um, in, in a superconducting fashion. And for this, we have to cool down the, the LHC. So we have the world's largest cryogenic system, which cools the whole thing down to 1.9 Kelvin, which is colder than outer space. If you take the microwave background of 2.7 Kelvin as what the temperature at outer space is. Well, you know, if you feel this, there's not much of a difference, but it's still colder. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so in order to do this, there's like, we have 120 tons of liquid helium in the system. This is roughly 700,000 liters of liquid helium in order to cool the LHC down. Now, in the bean pipes itself, <coughs> we try to produce a, a very good vacuum because you don't want to have these protons that circulate being disturbed by air molecules in, in these pipes. So the vacuum system has something like around 100 kilometers of pipes, which have a pressure of 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus 11 millibar which is, well, at least comparable to what's on the moon. Uh, some say it's like 10 times better than the moon, but it's extremely high vacuum. Okay? So there's quite some thought that has gone into this. And then, as I mentioned before, <coughs> there are like four detectors, so there are four interaction points where the beam lines actually cross, and these bunches of protons actually collide. And then you have four main detectors that are actually at these interaction points, and they record what's actually happening when these particles collide. So we have two general purpose detectors, which are ATLAS and CMS. Um, so both of them were involved in the Higgs discovery a couple of years ago, 2012, you may remember. Um, so just to give you an idea of the scale, it's, it's very hard to see even if I'm up front here, but here you see an engineer standing. So this gives you an idea of the size of the detector. It's like a multi-storage, the size is like a multi-storage building, it's enormous. Okay, <clears throat> and then you have CMS, so the C stands for compact. It's, it's half the size of Atlas, but it's twice the weight. So it's, it's a very dense detector, so this, this experiment alone weighs twice as much as the Eiffel Tower in Paris. So it's, it's very, very heavy. 
Then on the, other ha on the other side, we have two more experiments, <laughs> which are more specialized. So there's Alice, a large ion collider experiment, um, which is looking at uh, the collisions of not proton-proton by lead-lead ions. And this is to simulate um, the moments after the Big Bang. So they are studying something that's called the quark-gluon plasma, which is actually a state of matter where gluons and quarks lose the connections to the hadrons. And um, so this is what Alice is looking at. And then we have LHCb, um, and the B comes from the, from the um, B quark that um, um, they are studying in order to find out why there's an asymmetry between matter and antimatter. Okay, so I, I stop now with the, almost, with, with the LHC. I come to OpenStack, I promise, <coughs> soon. So these, these experiments produce enormous amounts of data, okay? So the collisions directly at the detector can produce up to one petabyte of data per second. This, of course, is not flying through any networks or something. I mean, this is then, this is really like on the hardware level, there, there's a, a multi-stage filtering that starts with electronics that's sorting out what data to store and what not. So we don't store one petabyte per second, but in general, the data that is produced directly at the detector is in this area. Okay, so here you see uh, an event in Alice, for instance. So this is what happens when lead ions collide. And then basically you see all the traces of what's, what's flying around in the detector. And then you try to say, make a sense out of this. Now, <coughs> the LHC is operated in so-called runs. So there's, there's a run where the accelerator is running and, and you're colliding protons and the, the, the experiments are measuring this. And then there are technical stops where the accelerator is upgraded and the experiments have a chance to actually uh, repair or upgrade their detectors. So currently we're in run two. We store uh, roughly 25 petabytes a year. But you see <laughs> this, this big bar already over here. So this is run four, and this is uh, roughly in 10 years from now. So we will go to something like 400 petabytes a year. And something very similar happens to the, to the need for, for compute. So this is, well, it's a very uh, community-specific metric, but you get the idea that basically from the computing we're doing now and the computing we have to do, or the computing we can afford if we assume that technology will evolve as it does now, uh, there's quite, a, quite some discrepancy and we have to think really hard what to do here. Now the data itself that's produced at, at, these, um, at these experiments is not all um, analyzed at CERN. What we have is the, the LHC computing group, the WACG, the Worldwide LHC Computing Group, it basically consists of a hierarchy of data centers with CERN as the tier zero in, in the middle, and then you have multiple tier one sites, which are larger um, labs that have direct links to CERN, where the data is sent for permanent storage, for reprocessing, and for first analysis. And from there, it's further distributed to the tier twos, which are usually smaller universities where users can also analyze the data. So in total, we're talking something like 170 uh, sites in, in 40 countries. Um, you see all the numbers over here. We'd be processing something like two million jobs a day where, where physicists actually, actually um, analyze the data. <coughs> now, in order to do this, at CERN, 90% of CERN's compute re resources are delivered on top of OpenStack. So we have multiple clouds at CERN. You see there's like uh, an experiment cloud in Atlas, there's one in Alice, and also one for, for CMS. And the blue one is the, uh, is the cloud that we have in IT. And in, in total, we're talking something like 200,000 cores and more than 8,000 hypervisors altogether. And the blue area is what I'm going to talk now in the rest of the talk. So I will introduce a little bit how our service looks like, uh, say some few words about how we operate this. Um, I will say a few words about performance issues that we have observed and how we address them, and say a few words about um, how we are going to expand the service. Now, CERN-IT is not a research department. Um, it's a service department. It's there in order to help CERN to fulfill its mission. Um, for this, we have two data centers. One is in Geneva, on the, on the Merin site, and another one is in uh, Budapest, at the Wigner Data Center, at a distance of 23 milliseconds. Both are connected via two dedicated 10, uh, 100 gigabit links at the moment. The cloud service is one of the three components that we introduced when we decided to adopt the, the AI paradigm 
a couple of years ago. So there's like we, we redid it or on monitoring, we redid the configuration management, moved everything to Puppet, and then we have the cloud, which is meant to be there for resource provisioning. And similar to what was said this morning um, by uh, Volkswagen and Mirantis, uh, with the um, cloud-first policy, I think they called it, uh, we have something very similar, which is all servers and IT should be virtual. So this is like when people come to us and say, like, look, we want to have resources, we point them to the cloud first. Um, the cloud is based on OpenStack. Um, we are running since roughly three years now in production. We have performed four rolling, almost four rolling upgrades since. Um, we're still in the transition from Kilo to Liberty. Um, you see that many of the components have already been migrated um, to Liberty. Magnum, I think, is even already on, on Nitaka. Um, Nova, in our case, is naturally always the last component we upgrade because it's the most complex one that we do. But this will happen in the next couple of weeks, so we'll be on Liberty in, in July, I think. Now, as I said, we have two data centers, and our deployment spans these, these two data centers. We use only one region in order to have one API. Um, but we ma make extensive use of the cells feature. So we have uh, 40 cells, which I think is a lot. Um, and the cells then map to various use cases. So we'll come to the use case a little bit later, but there's like personal VMs or batch VMs or service VMs, specific hardware, all of this maps to specific cells. And of course the geographic location as well. The top cell is on physical and virtual nodes. So we have at the moment I think only one physical node in the top cell, the rest are all, all virtual nodes. And this is an, an HA setup with uh, RabbitMQ, with mirror queues. But already the API servers, they are all virtual machines in the various sub -child, uh, child cells. The child cell controllers themselves are also all uh, OpenStack VMs. There we only have one controller per cell, um, which does everything, it also runs Rabbit. This is mostly a compromise between the complexity of the setup per cell versus the failure impact in case something goes wrong. So we, we started there as well with magic controllers and, and cluster Rabbit, but it gave us enough headaches that we decided, okay, it's much easier if you run in a non-clustered setup um, because the failure impact is, is relatively limited um, if you have one cell going down, which only means that you can't do open stack operations in that cell. And it works very well for us. So this is a... Uh, a picture of how this looks like, what I just described. So we have the top level controllers, uh, the API servers, which are virtual machines in the various cells, and then we have the, the child cell controllers, which run Rabbit themselves, and we have like roughly 200 compute nodes per cell, more or less. So this is like a size um, uh, that we think is, is like reasonable. So we had cells in the beginning growing very large to more than 1,000 nodes that gave some issues, so we decided to split it, and, and currently we're doing something like 200 to 250 notes. We have roughly 6,000 hypervisors in production. It's a little bit hard to say because there are currently servers going out, new servers coming in. The majority of them is running um, CERN Center 7, which is basically Center 7. Um, it's called CERN Center 7 because they're like very small changes. We have, for instance, we change the way updates are done, um, but only the, the, the frequency, I think. And we added some CERN-only repositories, I think. Apart from this, it's, it's really CentOS 7. We also have some 150 Hyper-V nodes in addition. Um, 2,000 out of these 6,000 are in, in Hungary. Uh, and 370 hypervisors are on critical power, which means they are, they are diesel-backed for, for important services. So in total, this is something like 155,000 cores, 350 terabytes of RAM. We're running with 18,000 VMs at the moment. And we're currently increasing the capacity. So I'm, I'm about to configure roughly 60,000 cores that are already there. It's going to be configured, and there will be another um, two-thirds of this in, in, in autumn, coming in autumn. Now, in our cloud, <coughs> every 10 seconds, roughly, a, a VM gets deleted or, or created. But as you can see, uh, th there, are some, there were some issues here when, when value went, uh, went down. So, so many of these are actually produced by our testing infrastructure. For, for Glance and also for Cinder, we use Ceph as a backend. So we have 2,700 images in, in Ceph for Glance and 2,300 volumes um, on Ceph um, for, for Cinder. We also have some volumes in NetApp, but this is mostly for, for Hyper-V um, because there's no Windows driver for, no RBD driver on Windows for Ceph. Um, and for, for application that require to or insist on 
having something like NAT as the backend. Uh, and we have Ceph deployments in, in both locations in Geneva and Vigna. So apart from like smaller annoyances, let's say, um, the only real bug we hit with Ceph um, during the two years, this part of the, the cloud services, or not the cloud service, but this, um, well, yeah, this part of the cloud service, the block storage, is in production, was this libnss bug um, where they were relying on uh, functional libnss that were actually not thread safe, which caused some of the VMs to actually crash, which was like extremely difficult to, to, to debug because it was extremely rare and there were no locks left, whatever, it just crashed, no dump. But then finally we identified this, and since then it's, it's all working fine. Uh, moving to operations. <coughs> so our deployment is based on RDO. Um, we use RDO upstream. So RDO is the, the um, RPM distribution of OpenStack. Um, we use upstream um, basically whenever possible. We have to do some patching um, required to adapt to the, to the CERN network, for instance, for Nova or when we do um, certain customizations in, in Horizon, but apart from this is, is RDO upstream. It works very well for us. The whole service is configured with the Puppet, um, which was also, as I mentioned, introduced with the adoption of the AI paradigm. And whenever possible, to pre preempt the question, uh, whenever possible, we, we submit things upstream. So CERN is contributing to OpenStack itself, to OpenStack Puppet, to RDO, so you will commit, find commits in, in all these projects from, from CERN. Updates. We do updates <coughs> service by service. And meanwhile, we have split all the services to virtual machines. All services have their own dedicated virtual machines, which helps a lot with updates because otherwise, if we have like, so in the beginning, we had, for instance, Cinder on the top level controllers. And if you wanted to upgrade Cinder, you also had to upgrade Nova at the same time because they may rely on some Python libraries at the same time, different versions. So we split this all. So it's uh, um, much easier now to upgrade. The only thing that we couldn't split so far as CML and Nova because they're both on the, on the compute nodes. Um, in order to prepare an upgrade, in order to test this, we use, well, it depends a little bit on the, on the preference of what the corresponding service manager does. Um, we use Packstack, um, for instance, in order to test simple things like database migrations. Um, DevStack is also used by some of them. Um, as I said, this depends a little bit on, the, on the how common complex the, the upgrade is. So for instance, Cinder is relatively easy to upgrade, while Nova is relatively complicated to upgrade. So we, we do testing from simple DB upgrades up to full shadow installations where we do the full, the full upgrade. What we introduced uh, recently is what we call the dev environment. So we can actually simulate the full CERN environment uh, on a laptop, um, even offline, so you can even do changes on, on the plane if you like. So the way we do this is we do use Docker containers in a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, it has a clone of the real actual Puppet uh, configuration. Um, it has parts for a mock-up mock -up of, of the Ceph clusters, of our specialized secret store, of our network databases. Um, it has a part for the central, um, as a central DB and, and, and Rabbit instance. And then we have parts each for for one of the services. So this is extremely powerful because what you do now is like on your laptop, you basically get a clone of the Git repository that has the Puppet configuration, you change on your local laptop, and it runs in your complete strong cloud on your laptop, if you like. And this way you can like do very rapid, very rapid development. So it's extremely powerful. And once you're done, you can actually push things back because the, the thing you have on your laptop is just a checkout of the real actual um, Git repository of Puppet, for instance. So for this, this is being tested. We can do full upgrade testing with this. One of the things that we need to do, um, I'm not clear on how, what the status is at the moment, is the support of cell and cells in this Puppet, in this um, setup. For the release of evolution, <coughs> I'm sorry, it's a little bit hard to see. So this, these are the, the OpenStack releases. The slide is basically to show that um, you can see how we um, increase the services that we actually offer with our cloud. Um, so the list is becoming longer and longer. Um, we are a little bit behind uh, the official releases. So we usually are like six months behind. Um, but we're basically following what, what, what OpenStack is doing upstream. Now, <coughs> our cloud is supposed to basically serve all kinds of use cases at CERN. So 
The largest service is the batch service. So this is basically where physics analysis runs. So this is um, using batch services like LSF or, or HD Condor. Um, there are lots of IT services that, that run on the cloud. Sometimes these services are even built on top of each other. So we have a, a file service with NFS, which is the virtual machines um, having mounted a Ceph volume, and the other services like Twiki using that uh, virtualized service. We have services that come directly from the experiments, like the build service where, for instance, Atlas builds all their software. This is all done on VMs. Uh, we have engineering services where the microelectronics uh, colleagues do their chip design. Um, we even have infrastructure services like, like the hostel booking system has on premise and its own hotel, its own hostel, <coughs> um, car rental, um, all this kind of stuff is also running there. And you also have personal VMs um, that you can, as a user at CERN, you get, you get a personal VM as well. So as you can imagine, this, this brings quite some, uh, this rich usage spectrum sounds very nice but it also brings a quite a rich requirement spectrum. So we have people coming with all kinds of requests of what they want to do. And I will say a little bit more about a CouchDB use case later on, I think. Also in terms of hardware, we have quite a spectrum <coughs> because um, the way we started is basically we, we adopted all the hardware that was there in the computer center was decommissioned from other services. Um, so we have AMD and Intel, which vary in the available features, which differ in the size of NUMA nodes, for instance. Um, we have machines with different quarter run ratio, one to two, one to four, one to one and a half. So we have all kinds of, of stuff there. Um, the core to disk ratio is differing because we have different generation of drives. Uh, it's now even going down with the introduction of SSDs. Um, we have different disk layouts, we have different networks. We have, as I mentioned, critical power and physics power. We have different physical location. We have different network domains. We have different operating system. So it's quite a zoo of things that we have to take care of. Um, and this variety is also to some degree reflected in the types of instances that users can request, um, but it's not necessarily visible to the user because otherwise the user gets overwhelmed with, with all the things he can do. Uh, I will say a little bit more about this in a second. So what we do, oh, the second is already now. <coughs> so um, what we do is like we have um, like uh, what we call the M2 flavor type, which is basically what we regard as the ba basic building blocks. Um, you get uh, from 1 to, to 32 cores with a little bit less than 2 gigabytes per, uh, per core, uh, which is also a lesson that we learned that you should not hand out all the memory that you have on your hypervisors, um, but leave something for the hypervisor to live, otherwise you will, this will create sadness. And you have 10, 10 gigabytes um, of disk space per core, roughly. So this is basically what we ask users to, to use. And in addition to this, um, we say, okay, if you need more storage, use, use volumes. So we have um, seven different volume types, which vary in, in, in the terms of uh, performance they can deliver, um, which have other features like uh, where they are, for instance, on critical power um, or in, in, the, in the location. So we have, um, as I said, two self-clusters in Geneva and in Budapest. And as I also already mentioned, most of this is hosted in Ceph. Only the... Um, the Hyper-V nodes, and where people insist, we have, we have NetApp as a backend. Now, one thing that <coughs> helped us a lot when we doing this, because you can imagine with, with all the users that we have, we get like daily multiple requests for resources, um, project creation requests where people say, I need, I need so and so many cores and so and so much RAM. And then it needs to go to some workflow where it's approved, it needs to, the project needs to be created, the groups need to be set up, the quota needs to be assigned and all this. So on. So what we use for this is Rundeck, <coughs> which is a, a, a tool to automate these routine procedures. Um, and it's also a common place where you can like, um, collect all these workflows together. So we have various workflows for, as I just mentioned, the project creation. If people want to change their quota. Um, what we get is a ticket saying, I want more quota, then it goes somewhere to, to be approved. It comes back and then we basically enter the ticket number and the tool basically goes and updates the quota or creates the project. Um, assigns the, the corresponding rights and so on. We also use this, for instance, when we have to do hardware interventions in order to notify the VM owners. So a disk is broken, needs to be replaced, or a memory module needs to be uh, replaced. What happens is that the sysadmins get an alarm, and they can use a procedure to actually that will actually find out whose VMs are running there, will notify the users, saying, like, look, in a week from now, there will be an intervention. Um, your machine will go down. Please do something or react now. Um, but this is all automated and we don't have to deal with this anymore. So it was a, a big, big help. 
Another thing that we have to do <coughs> at the moment, also related to operations, um, is retirement. So for the first time we have actually, because the service is now three years old, um, we have to retire uh, machines that host services. So 1,600 nodes have to be moved out by the, uh, towards the end of the year. Actually, um, the, the problem is not so much the, the compute part, the problem is the services where people run their services and you cannot you know, just shut the machine down and say, like, build your service somewhere else. Uh, so what we're trying to do is like, we're trying to live migrate this to, to new capacity whenever possible, but there are some certain limits. So for instance, if you have AMD and Intel, it is not that easy to, to live migrate things between. There are not network constraints. Uh, there are all kinds of things. If you have volumes attached, you cannot live migrate. All these kind of things uh, you have to take into account. So what we have done now is we have a tool, developed a tool that actually you can give a hypervisor and say, like, okay, drain it, and it will find and know what to do with the individual VMs. So we're currently in the, uh, doing this at the moment. One of the things that you may be interested in, or the networking experts among you are interested in, is um, one of the things that we have is we have the, the network at CERN is, is compartmentalized into smaller, what we call IP services, which is basically switches, and you cannot migrate IP addresses between switches. Um, but the networking colleagues came up with this IP bridging, service bridging idea. So I invite you to have a look at this talk in order to see how to, how to do this. Talking about networks, one of the things that we need to do is move out of Nova Network. So we are still on Nova Network, which is going to be deprecated really, really, really this time. So it's going to go away and we have to, to move to Neutron, uh, which will bring a lot of new features and may also help with some of the work that we have to do, for instance, when it comes to patching. Um, because so far we always need to um, patch things in the code again and again, while Neutron allows for out of, out of tree plugins, which should, should make this a little bit easier. So for this, <coughs> at the moment, this is like, well, we haven't migrated to Neutron yet. We have two working Neutron cells, almost three, I'd say. Um, uh, the control plane is, is already in, in liberty with, with full, full HA. Um, the bridge agent, because it's running on the, on the computer, it's still, it's still in Nova, and we have, still have to do some work. And, and this is a quote I like very much from the official documentation. There's no way to cleanly migrate from Nova network to Neutron, which mostly applies to uh, the fact that there's like no way that um, fits everyone. In our case, it shouldn't be too bad, I hope. Another thing that we recently introduced is, is Magnum, as you saw on the list. Um, so um, to have cont container orchestration engine as a first class resource, we have a pre-production service available with supporting Swarm and Kubernetes for now. Colleagues are looking at Mesos, adding Meson at the moment. This is very popular at CERN for various things. So some use cases are the, the GitLab continuous integration. Um, there's uh, the Jupyter IPython notebook uh, Swan service, which is allowing you to analyze data in your uh, in a web browser, the file transport service. So there are lots of services that are actually very interested in. And <coughs> the last thing for, for the operations part or what we are currently doing is looking at federation of clouds. We spend a lot of work in being able to actually federate clouds. So we allow now EduGain uh, users to actually access the CERN, the CERN cloud. They have limited access to a, a tenant in, in OpenStack. But as I mentioned before, there are like various clouds, also the integration with public clouds, where it will become very important for us to actually allow for, for federation. <coughs> so for performance, uh, one of my favorite topics. So <coughs> um, w when we started the cloud, we basically let everyone onto the cloud and everyone was doing the service there. And then very soon afterwards, we hit the first issues with people complaining it's too slow. This is, of course, on top of the, um, well, the emotional resistance that someone's service can run on VMs, while beforehand it was always running on physical service, um, which we had to overcome. We're still working on this, though. So usually what people um, come with is like very high IO weight, so they come with graphs like this. I don't know if you can, can see this, actually. So this is like CPU load, this green bar here on the top, so this 100% CPU, this green bar on the top is basically I.O. weight, so it's like 20% 20, 20 I.O. weight, so the server is basically only waiting for, for, for I.O. And the user expects that the local hard drive is as fast as a local drive. Sorry, the local hard drive on the VM is as fast as a physical drive, okay? Which is, in our case, wasn't the case, because the hypervisors had like two spinning drives, and then we had 10 VMs all hammering these two spinning drives, so we get like a very slow VM. Okay, it was no surprise we saw this. So one of the things that we found was actually very helpful back at the time, you could still um, configure the, the IO scheduler 
on a, um, on a virtual machine, and in our case, it was using deadline as a default, um, which can block writes up to five seconds, which is very bad if you have an, an interactive service where you try to actually log in. Because what may happen is that if you have high IO, late, uh, high IO, weight, uh, high IO load, sorry, um, is that you try to log in and the, the authentication daemon tries to update a small thing in the database and it can't, or it has to wait very long. So what you see here in the graph is basically a small benchmark of, so this is the, the time to log in, so it's a loop, it's basically logging in. And then I start an I.O. benchmark on the VM to simulate some activity, and you see how the login time actually explodes. And then I change the I.O. Um, scheduler from deadline to CFQ, which is much better for an interactive system. So this at least, well, it doesn't bring it back to, the, to an idle machine, but at least it's much more predictable and, and much more lower. So if you have issues like this, it's maybe worth looking at the I.O. scheduling. The other thing we do, <coughs> of course, um, is, is Cinder. Um, so this is actually a real plot from the Atlas uh, trigger and dark monitoring application. And you see here the time spent in, in IO weight in percent. So this is something like 10% like or something. And then I change the volume type from, from uh, standard to, to IO1, which if you remember goes from 100 IOPS to 500 IOPS. And you see how the time spent in IO weight basically drops with this. So the, this was basically, the volume was basically too slow. No, no, you would think that, okay, fine, if that works that well, we just go to 1,000 and we eliminate the problem. But this didn't help in that case because at some point, latency plays a role and if the application is not able to have enough uh, requests in flight, it doesn't help you that the backend can handle more requests. So we, we needed to reduce the latency as well in order to achieve something, which is the blue line here, which is the former virtualization infrastructure which was running on very expensive dedicated hardware. So what we were playing with is... Um, block level caching. So basically you add an SSD to the hypervisor and you do block level caching. There are various options for this. Um, we use flash cache and other servers. Um, B cache is an option. DM cache um, is something that Red Hat supports, for instance. In the end, we chose B cache because it was very easy to set up and it has very strong error handling. So basically all the accesses, so this is on the hypervisor, all the accesses to the, to the device are basically cached on the SSD and then like trickle out to the, um, to the underlying device. So this, with this and the right access pattern, let's say, you can get something from something like 50 IOPS to, to a couple of thousand, depending on your, on your SST. So that's a very nice um, thing that we still have in production, for instance, for the, for the build service for Atlas, where Atlas builds the software. <coughs> now, um, right, so this is the, the, the application that I mentioned before. This is, this is the, the um, TDAC, the trigger and um, data acquisition monitoring application, where basically we, we changed the, the caching mode. So this is on a B cache node, where I then changed the cache mode to, um, to write back, and you see that how, how the IO weight drops here. So this is actually, for some application, good enough to, in order to overcome the limitations you have with latency. Now, the problem with this is that you have the SSD now and the hypervisor, the SSDs that we had for this specific case were like 250 gigabytes or something. And if you have many, uh, many VMs, that's pretty small, so there's not so much space. So what, you, what people need is, of course, something that is like fast, low latency, and big. Right? So now, meanwhile, we also have realized that we, it's better to use SSD-only hypervisors. Um, but these hypervisors may be too small, so you saw like 10 gigabytes per core, so if you have like uh, 960 terabyte um, SSDs, and then you share this between 32 cores, there's not so much that, that, that is left per core. So we're trying to, at the moment, so this is relatively new, to, to leverage the, the idea of, of using caching and make use of some of the ZFS features where you can actually put the, the L2ARC cache and the ZFS intent log on a local device on the VM and then have a volume behind. So basically, on the VM, you use ZFS cache on the ephemeral drive, which is on the hypervisor, which is on the SSD, and then on the other side you have a volume. And this seems to be working pretty nicely, actually. And this combines like low latency and, and, and space. Now the other thing, the other thing that uh, we spend a lot of time on is, is CPU performance. So what we realized <coughs> a while ago is that um, on our full node VMs, so VMs that spend the whole hypervisor, which we had to run because of the, some of the limitations of, of the batch systems, we saw that in our specific benchmark, um, the 
performance is like 20% lower than what you would expect from the physical from the physical machines. Um, smaller VMs, VMs were much much better, but as I said, we had to to run these like large large VMs. So we investigated, of course, various tunings in order to to do this. So we looked at kind of same page merging. Um, extended page tables, physical address extensions, pinning, but we also had like different hardware, and, and the various options vary in with their impact depending on which hardware we run on, so it was pretty difficult, but we managed to bring it down to something like 10%, which was still not acceptable. So it was a st still a 10% loss. Um, luckily, at the time, we were still running Hyper-V, or we, we're still doing now, but we had also had Hyper-V, and it, it's not a, or it wasn't, we identified, it's not a general virtualization issue because one of the worries was that this is always like, in virtualization, it's always like this. In our specific applications, you lose 10%, which would have been quite bad. But on Hyper-V, we created VMs, and you could see that basically they give, they give the hardware performance, more or less. And the main difference between Hyper-V and KVM was, was the NUMA awareness at the time. So... <coughs> So we identified that NUMA awareness is the most efficient setting when you want to improve, improve your performance. And we managed with making the VMs NUMA aware that actually you can reduce things to like few percent, few percent overhead in our so HS06 that you have seen a couple of times is this very specific HAP application um, biased benchmark, let's say. What we were hit by then, so we thought, okay, this is all solved, very nice. We do we do NUMA. Awareness, and we are we are all all good. Um, one of the things that we identified before was switching off EPT. So EPT is the support for page table translations in, in hardware, and in our specific benchmark, <coughs> if you switch off EPT, the benchmark gives a much better number. So you gain 20%. This has also been seen by other labs. So we tested this, switched it off. Yeah, very nice. The problem is that actually the hardware to to um, speed up page table translations is there for a reason. And we were hit by this because some of the applications actually do very heavy page table translation, and they were slowed down so much um, that, that it had a very large impact on, on the experiment workflow. So this was very hard for us to see because it's only a fraction of the machine and it's only a fraction of their jobs that actually exhibit this behavior, but it was, the impact was very, very heavy, very large. So what we had to do is like we had to move to something where we would could EPT, switch the EPT on again lose that recurrent performance um, in order to avoid these jobs. But ideally, of course, we wanted to keep the, the high performance. So what we moved to is we enable huge pages in order to reduce the amount of times you have to actually do page level translations. So we went with um, two megabyte huge pages. One gigabyte is even better in terms of performance, but we didn't feel very comfortable with one gigabyte huge pages. It feels very, very big. Um, there's more details on, on this whole topic and in, if you follow this link. So we rolled this out <coughs> on, on our 2,000 batch hypervisors and 6,000 VMs. It's a little bit tricky because um, we implemented the huge page allocations as a boot parameter. So we had to um, actually reboot all the hypervisors to make sure that the uh, memory is actually allocated. Um, and the NUMA awareness is, is a flavor metadata. So we had to delete all these VMs and recreate them. So it took a couple of weeks to do this. Um, Together with the batch team, we had to reshuffle resources so that the impact on, on the users is relatively small. Um, but after eight weeks was done, and then so far we haven't seen any, any CPU-related performance issues since. Now, because I'm running a little bit out of time, um, there's like, I think, two or three more slides. Um, one is on, on the future plans, what we do to do next. So one of the things that we look at <coughs> is um, investigate ironic and do bare metal provisioning. So we've been working very hard uh, with the user community to actually make things run on virtual machines. The um, ZFS, uh, Zill L2 Arc um, idea that I, I showed on the slides before was actually pushed by one of the experiments having very large couch DB, um, a very large couch DB service which is trying to squeeze on the onto, onto VMs. <coughs> But I guess we have to accept that there are some use cases where we have to uh, do bare metal provisioning, where we have to provide um, 
physical machines. So we want to do this through OpenStack, so we have a one-stop shop where we actually get resources. This also allows you for complete accounting, so you actually know where all your machines are, are gone. And also for, for Magnum and the whole container area, that would be very nice to run on metal rather than on virtual machines, as, as we do now. So this is one of the things we want to look at. The second thing is that <coughs> we'd like to get rid of, of Hyper-V in our, in our installation. This is more to like um, simplify our setup because we have to have dedicated Windows experts that look after this. Um, this has already been done at other sites. I mean, other HEP sites, high energy physics sites, run the whole thing um, on, on KVM. Even the Windows infrastructure like Active Directory on virtual machines that run on KVM. Um, for us, it's mainly the, the removal of the dependency on our Windows experts. Um, and of course, it will reduce the, the overall complexity in our setup. So this is what we're currently working on. First test looks actually pretty good. So with this, I'm, I'm basically done. So we have a production service at CERN since about three years. Um, we're trying to work as close as possible with the various communities. The service is still growing. We have very good experiments, a very good experience with, um, with the sales features, even though it's still uh, marked as experimental. But for us, it was crucial to actually uh, get to the size that we are. Um, we have gained a lot of experience with general resource provisioning because all resource requests now are routed through the cloud team first, so we are the first one to examine every request. Um, and uh, yeah, we're very hard to convince that you need a physical machine. We have added a, quite some new features in, in the uh, past couple of months, like containers and identity for federation, and we also plan to look at bare metal provisioning, as I just said. Um, but there are also major operational challenges like the networking area and also the, the transparent retirement of, of machines that we're currently working on, but it's all working fine so far. So if you're interested in the CERN Cloud, <coughs> uh, I invite you to have a look at, at our blog. So there we post every couple of weeks, we post uh, things uh, that we have done and, and, and things that we have encountered, issues or, and problems and solutions. And th the most recent post is from uh, end of last week, where you can read how we scaled Magnum and Kubernetes to do two million requests per second, which is one million requests more than Google did. So we're very proud of this. And with this, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> okay, thank you, Anna. Any questions? We commit upstream. Yeah, I was going to say, th <laughs> thank you very much for the talk, by the way, and thank you for um, um, already taking that question so I get a, another shot. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you reshuffle or can you reshuffle due to load so the, the, the different projects could um, explode in, in the load they create all right. of a sudden and you want to shuffle the VMs around? I right. mean, technically you can, but do you kind of feed back the actual load the, the machines create? Right. Uh, the answer is no. We don't do this. So usually what we, ha what we observe, so we don't do any um, overcommit. So there's no uh, CPU overcommit, there's no memory overcommit. So uh, yeah, otherwise it's, it's very hard to sell to users because they say, well, my application doesn't work. It's because you overcommit everything. And then we say, no. So if you get a core, well, it's a virtualized core and it's an SMT core, but it's not overcommitted. So we don't do this. And usually, so the only thing that we still share, well, the two things that we still share, of course, is the disk. But now with the we call the shared cells where you have services running. They're all on SSDs now, or mostly on SSD, let's say. So we, we're moving from like 100 IOPS to something like 30,000 IOPS or 25,000 IOPS, something like this. So that shouldn't, should, like, we shouldn't see these graphs anymore where you see IO weight like, at 10%. Um, the only other area that we, of course, share is the network. Um, so far, we had very few cases where people actually fill the network with their services. We have seen cases, but um, we're also moving from one gigabit to 10 gigabit Ethernet now. It hasn't been so much of a, of a big issue. So the answer is no, we don't shuffle things around at the moment. But we may do this because of the tool that I just mentioned. So <clears throat> one of the things that we're doing now when we get new hardware, um, beforehand what we had is like we had this like per cell, we had multiple IP services, which actually were the boundaries in, in which you could migrate machines around. Now with the new deliveries that we get, we basically have like one broadcast domain per cell, so that means like 250 machines. And we may start looking into, like for instance, for hypervisor intervention, if we can actually move the VM off so that the user doesn't even need to be notified in order to do the hardware intervention. But at the moment, we don't do this. Okay. 
Okay, next one. This one in the back. Okay. Hi. Hey. Um, quick question. Um, I would I would uh, reckon that quite a number of users at the CERN uh, maybe want to run MPI jobs, who would you know want to need um, low latency backend like Infiniband. Right. Do, do you also point these users to the cloud, or what do you do with them? So. <clears throat> Actually, that's true. So we have so there are not that many users for, for MPI, but we have um, some use cases for well HPC computing for uh, in particular the theoretical physicists. Um, for this, um, we have dedicated um, dedicated clusters, so they don't work on the cloud. And there we have uh, InfiniBand clusters, for instance. Yeah. So this is one of the areas where where we have to say, okay, fine, we we can't do this, right? And we you have to use something else. But it's it's the exception. Okay. So. Mm. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And uh, one question uh, about ZFS. So, how stable would you rate the open ZFS implementation? Right. And do you see any challenges with licensing on the ZFS portion on Linux? No. So, so I, from what I know, there's like no no licensing issue anymore. It has there has been for a long time. If you remember the whole story about Luster and so, so this is uh, quite an issue, quite a while. I think there's there's no license issue for, for ZFS on Linux. As for the stability, <coughs> so I have to admit that for the cloud servers in this particular use, use cases, I've been only using this setup for uh, something like three weeks or so. Um, the experiment, however, is like trying to break it um, to, to see if that's really a solid solution. There are other services, however, like the uh, the Filer service, for instance, that I mentioned, that is actually providing a central NFS service uh, with virtual machines and Ceph volumes, and they use ZFS since a long time already. They, and they have, haven't have observed a single issue with this. So from, from what I know, it, it's, it's rock solid technology. It works very well. And these features like, like the ZFS, uh, ZIL, and the L2ARC that you can change in size and switch on and off. So you can take, for instance, you can take the SSD out and, and full, full running and so. I mean, this, this is like, these are awesome features. It's, an, it's a very nice file system. So from my point of view, it works very well. Thanks. Okay. Anyone else? Thanks again for the presentation. Yes. Two-step question from my side. Why did you decide for Hyper-V? Was it whatever low overhead, what we've seen, or licensing costs? And second, more complex question is, um, you're experimenting with Ironic right now. How does your whatever rack and stack cabling process until install of Noma Compute Node process look like now, and also the Puppet integration? I guess with so many cells and um, sorry, Hattery, yeah. hardware, you need a lot of uh, configuration there, <coughs> the puppet. Right. Thanks. Okay, so for the Hyper-V question, <coughs> um, there's like probably multiple reasons for why we have Hyper-V. One is that the former virtualization service, so in the beginning, like a couple of years ago, like five years ago, six years ago, we had a different or the predecessor of the of the virtualization infrastructure, which was based on Hyper-V. Okay, so um, I think this is the reason why Hyper-V also like moved in, in, into OpenStack, um, because the people running the old infrastructure are also now part of the team that are running the new infrastructure. Uh, so there's one reason. Another reason is <coughs> support. So there were worries about what happens on your uh, Windows application that is running in a Windows machine that is running on KVM, for instance. What does your support say about this? Do they feel comfortable with this? Do they like this? What happens if something breaks? I think this is uh, where the reasons why we were using Hyper-V. Um, apparently, all these issues have been more or less solved. And this is why we are now, so the Windows colleagues are actually fine with running their services on, on KVM. So this is why we're currently trying to convince them to use KVM and then test with them. For the second question, that, that's indeed a pretty complex <laughs> complex question. So, <clears throat> of course, when I say like we have the zoo of hardware, it's not what we want, right? It's what we have. 
So what we want is like uniform hardware if possible, or at least more uniform as it is now, and this is what we are moving to. So the reason why we have these, all these core ratios uh, of one to one and a half, for instance, is because the cloud basically adopted all the hardware that was freed by other services. The hardware that we buy now, like this um, 60,000 cores, this is a very uniform. The machines basically look, look all the same, which simplifies things a lot. Um, we have various teams, so we have a team that does the procurement, we have a team that does the installation and, and the cabling, we have a network team that takes care of the network. Uh, so the machines, when they arrive with us, it's, well, we influence how things are set up, for instance, how the cabling is done and how, or how the broadcast domains are set up, but this is also very recent because of the experience we made uh, with this, like, boundaries in which you can migrate machines around, um, where we're trying to, like, change the way things are done. But yeah, I'm, ha I'm happy to talk about this in more detail, maybe offline, because it's like a very complex process, of course. But we try to simplify things. So th this is not what you should aim for, right? You should try to make it simpler. It's just that. Okay. Next one there. <coughs> Hello. Uh, do you have some kind of centralized backup structure? Uh, so the answer is no. So I was very pleased to hear this morning that when this question was asked to, to Volkswagen, if they, I think it was Volkswagen, uh, whether they actually back things up and they say no. Uh, we don't do, do that either. So what we ask the users is to, they should regard a VM that they get from our service, from infrastructure as a service, just as a physical machine. And just as you have to take care of your physical machine as well, uh, you have to like do backups of your machine as well. Of course, we have um, a backup service at CERN, so there are actually means that allow you, also puppetize means to do this, but we as the service don't do it for you. Okay? So if you run a service and you think your data should be backed up, there are means and puppet, and there's a service that will take your data, various services actually, depending on what, what you want to backup and how much and at which frequency, but it's not that we control this. Okay. Any questions left? Or okay, looks like we're done. So thank you, Anna. Thanks.